three persons will appear. Mr. Toyoda, the chairman and the CEO of the Institute of Energy Economies of Japan. Uh, he used to be a former uh, vice president, vice uh, minister uh, for international affairs of METI. And uh, uh, Ms. Barbara Weisel, where is she now? Is she now here? Or oh, she left uh, temporarily. Uh, Barbara uh, is a, a assistant U.S. trade representative for South East Asia and the Pacific. And uh, Mr. Mark uh, Sinclair, lead um, negotiator, Trans-Pacific Partnership Minist Minist uh, TPP, Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Trade uh, from New Zealand. And so, uh, Mr. Toda, first, please. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for uh, um, giving me this opportunity to talk about um, um, shaping the TPP and, and possible Japanese uh, um, contribution. Um, I think uh, it's quite timely to talk about uh, um, these um, topics uh, since, as uh, Hatakiyama and others uh, uh, pointed out, uh, uh, Prime Minister Kham um, referred to uh, uh, the study of Japanese participation in TPP um, in his first uh, uh, policy statement when uh, uh, the diet session started uh, early uh, this month. And, and, and very serious discussion uh, is being made uh, um, at ministerial level almost uh, every day. Uh, so in that uh, regard, it's, it's really timely for us to discuss uh, um, the TPP and the uh, Japanese uh, uh, contribution. Uh, what I would like to uh, discuss first, uh, um, can APEC address uh, global challenges? Uh, um, and, and then what role will TPP play in galvanizing? I, I really like uh, the word which uh, Mr. Price used. Uh, I really agree with you. Uh, uh, perhaps uh, um, galvanizing APEC, uh, this is uh, um, expectation of ours uh, about the TPP, and also third, of what is the right to membership and, 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 and substance, and fourth, the possible Japanese contribution in shaping TPP. And, and, and clearly, I have to uh, talk about uh, uh, some difficulties which uh, Japan uh, is uh, facing in joining um, TPP. First, uh, um, it's, it's about pay APEC. Um, I do not have to go in into details. Uh, already um, many uh, discussions, uh, panelists uh, talk about APEC, but, but um, um, compared with what uh, um, Dr. Bargusen said, uh, I'd like to be a little bit more ambitious about the role of APEC uh, in addition to COVID's uh, global uh, economic crisis, I'd like to add two more things. Uh, uh, APEC can somehow play a role in, in um, stimulating um, stagnant negotiation of Doha. And, and thirdly, um, I'd like to uh, talk about uh, the role of uh, uh, APEC uh, 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 in the context of uh, our climate, uh, climate change. Um, how these things are related to um, TPP? That's uh, uh, what I would like to uh, discuss uh, uh, 
uh, today. Uh, on the first uh, uh, issue of global economic crisis, uh, well, this is a problem uh, for all of us, uh, uh, particularly uh, among developed uh, uh, economies. Um, but fortunately, uh, Asia is regarded to be a, a center of uh, 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 economic uh, growth. Um, China, ASEAN, uh, and in the neighboring rear, uh, uh, area, we have uh, India, uh, all of them uh, are growing very rapidly in the order of uh, seven or eight or uh, nine or 10 percent uh, um, annual, annual growth. Uh, what uh, APEC can do uh, is uh, to uh, uh, help them continue to be a growth center uh, in uh, the world uh, economy. And by doing that, uh, um, APEC can uh, uh, play a key, key role. Um, I have to uh, uh, connect this role of APEC uh, uh, with uh, um, TPP. Um, uh, I would think uh, uh, simply by um, referring that uh, uh, TPP, if it can involve the uh, major uh, APEC economies, and, and then uh, this could be an uh, uh, effective uh, shortcut to uh, FTAPP, FTA, and, and then uh, it would do uh, 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 a function as uh, helping Asia um, continue to be a, a, growth, uh, a growth center. In, 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 in that context, uh, the important thing is uh, membership. Um, as uh, uh, some of the panelists uh, explained, um, um, we think uh, um, nine countries uh, already uh, started negotiation are not uh, are quite sufficient. Um, I would say uh, uh, if uh, uh, Japan is ready to participate, if um, um, Canada is uh, uh, willing to particip participate, and, and uh, uh, Korea, Taiwan, and even China, if they are uh, ready to participate, uh, um, uh, we would have all of them in this uh, uh, TPP exercise, and, and then uh, it could uh, essentially uh, become uh, FTAP, and, and, and it would uh, mean a sort of uh, uh, epic-wide economic integration uh, would be, would be uh, completed. And so in that regard, uh, the membership of um, uh, TPP is, is quite important in uh, addressing the first uh, uh, global uh, challenge through uh, uh, APEC. And the, the second uh, challenge, uh, uh, Doha uh, negotiation. Um, unfortunately, um, as everybody knows, uh, uh, Doha negotiation um, uh, is rather uh, stagnant. Um, at the outset of uh, uh, the launch of, of the Doha negotiation, um, the scope was larger. Um, uh, at this moment, uh, the scope is limited. Um, it has agriculture negotiation, manufacturing negotiation, rules negotiation, trade facilitation, um, and uh, uh, service negotiation in a very much limited, uh, limited manner. But uh, the, when the Doha negotiation was launched in 2001, the scope was much larger. Uh, it included uh, uh, investment and, and competition. Um, at that time, or I would say in Cancun uh, ministerial meeting, uh, most people, uh, most negotiators uh, thought uh, if the scope is limited, the conclusion would be easier. But uh, unfortunately, uh, that was not the case. Still, uh, um, uh, uh, the negotiation is, is, is going. But uh, we have to admit that uh, the speed is quite uh, uh, quite slow. Um, then, what uh, TPP uh, can do for um, um, this Doha uh, negotiation? Um, I, I think uh, Doha can be a sort of uh, a very good stimulant 
to uh, um, uh, Doha uh, round. In, in that context, uh, the important thing is uh, um, substance or scope. Um, now we, we understand uh, um, the negotiation is being made uh, um, under 24 uh, uh, working, working groups. Um, I understand there is uh, um, uh, access negotiation uh, in the area of agricultural products, uh, manufacturing products, and there are many service uh, negotiations, um, uh, telecommunication, finance, uh, e-commerce, and in addition to that, uh, uh, the scope includes uh, uh, um, government procurement, intellectual property, uh, uh, TBT, investment, uh, competition, and, and, and furthermore, um, environment and, and, and labor and, 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 and uh, even uh, dispute settlement uh, uh, is also uh, included. So essentially what uh, our TPP is trying to do is to uh, uh, set up a, a sort of suitable uh, uh, trade and investment rules uh, for 21st century. And, and, and so uh, if we can have this uh, 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 TPP uh, negotiation concluded, uh, uh, this could be a very good uh, stimulant to uh, um, move up, uh, 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 Doha round uh, ahead. And, 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 and thirdly, um, it's uh, uh, also uh, 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 be uh, of a great help to uh, 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 slow moving, um, uh, stimulate slow moving uh, uh, climate change uh, nego negotiation uh, uh, go ahead. We understand uh, the 21st Four groups uh, uh, includes uh, um, uh, environment uh, um, uh, negotiations. Uh, we don't know uh, details of negotiation, but, but um, uh, if we can link uh, some sort of uh, obligation uh, with uh, technological uh, transfer uh, to uh, developing countries, uh, uh, again, uh, this DPP uh, could be of a great help to resolve uh, 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 climate change um, negotiation and uh, 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 stimulation to slow moving um, climate change uh, negotiation as well. Uh, then uh, what uh, sort of uh, membership uh, uh, we should have and what sort of uh, uh, substance uh, we should have. I, I think uh, uh, the, the, uh, for the substance already I mentioned um, uh, uh, we understand that the substance of, or scope of negotiation is good enough to uh, uh, address the three global uh, challenges and, 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 and the membership. Uh, again, I have already uh, mentioned uh, as many countries as possible, if uh, every uh, country is ready to put everything on the table um, and, and, and ready to negotiate, um, then uh, they should be welcome. And, and, and then uh, membership uh, can uh, be uh, the right one. I, I think um, uh, in order to let the TPP uh, galvanize APEC, in order to TPP address um, the three global uh, challenges, uh, um, we have to have a right membership. We have to have a, a right uh, um, uh, 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 substance in terms of uh, scope. And lastly, I uh, have to mention some uh, uh, difficulty which uh, the Japanese uh, uh, government uh, uh, is uh, uh, discussing. Uh, there are two things. One is that uh, uh, the impact uh, uh, of Japanese participation in TPP uh, on uh, uh, food security uh, issue. Already um, discussion was made uh, on the basis of, of questions, uh, but, but 
Um, it, it is uh, um, true that uh, um, now uh, at ministry level, um, discussion is being made uh, very seriously. Uh, one uh, good uh, um, uh, uh, policy device under the DPJ uh, government is the introduction of uh, uh, income compensation. And uh, income compensation at this moment is not a perfect one, um, but um, um, uh, it uh, could be uh, improved uh, uh, to promote uh, um, um, uh, a structural uh, reform, and, and, and then it would do, uh, enhance the competitiveness of uh, Japanese uh, uh, agricultural uh, industry. And, and, and then I, I think uh, um, Japan could be uh, ready uh, to participate in um, uh, uh, TPP without uh, uh, any um, uh, exception beforehand. Um, everything can be on the table, and uh, um, negotiation can um, go ahead. But there is another concern uh, uh, among um, some Japanese uh, uh, about um, uh, sort of preconditions uh, to uh, let uh, Japan uh, participate in the uh, TPP uh, negotiation, uh, which is a solution of some uh, uh, bilateral uh, 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 issues. Um, I understand um, uh, uh, this is a minority view in the United States, uh, but, but some uh, people are saying that uh, uh, bilateral issues like uh, BSC or others uh, 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 could be resolved before uh, the participation of, of Japan in the negotiation. Um, but um, uh, when uh, the Japanese government is ready to put everything on the table, uh, why? Uh, those bilateral issues should be resolved beforehand. Um, I think um, it's fair um, uh, to say that um, uh, everything, when Japanese government is to ready to put everything on the table, um, um, we uh, understand um, uh, uh, all um, existing member economies of uh, TPP uh, would welcome that uh, uh, Japanese uh, uh, position. Um, at this moment, we understand uh, still serious discussion is going on uh, at ministerial level. Uh, the final decision is not uh, being made yet, but uh, we hope that uh, uh, whenever uh, Japanese government has decided to put everything on the table uh, of negotiation, and, and then uh, everybody would welcome that uh, uh, position without any uh, preconditions. U.S. government, U.S. officials, uh, U.S. industry, and U.S. Uh, um, uh, Congress uh, people, all of them uh, are ready to uh, welcome that Japanese position. Um, that's what I am hoping uh, to see just not for uh, Japan sake, just for US-Japan relationship, and just for galvanizing uh, APEC, just for uh, addressing the whole uh, series of uh, uh, global challenges. Thank you very much. I want to start by expressing appreciation to Fred and Jeff and the Peterson Economic Institute for not just holding this conference, but for all of the support they've given to us as we're working through establishing our approach on TPP, and also to the Japan Economic Foundation for hosting today's conference. Um, I'm honored to be on a panel with Mr. Toyota, who probably doesn't remember me as a junior negotiator when he was senior to me in many years that I worked on Japan, but it's a pleasure to see him, and also to be on a panel with Mark Sinclair, who will keep me honest because anything that I say, he's going to follow me and he's going to correct the record. Um, uh, those of us who have been working on this agreement have been spending a lot of time thinking about this negotiation and what we're trying to achieve here. And there are many people in the room uh, to whom we owe a debt of gratitude for all of the support that they've given us so far in getting us where we are in the process to date. And Hopefully, we'll continue to provide that support as we continue. 
We began this negotiation understanding the significant strategic and commercial implications of the TPP, which have been discussed this morning. And we are acutely aware as well of the difficult environment with, which, in which we're operating, not just on the economic and financial side, but here in the United States on the political side and the extremely d difficult environment on trade in which we're operating. So from the first day when we began thinking about this negotiation, we began unprecedented, broad, and regular outreach to stakeholders on TPP in a very close and unprecedented partnership with Congress. And I think that this outreach has, so far at least, helped us get to where we are in developing what we hope are balanced and carefully put together positions. We also hope that over time it will help us build a consensus in the United States in support of the agreement. And at least so far, I'm happy to say that we have broad support from Congress and stakeholders for this negotiation. And with this support, we've been able to make solid progress in the first three rounds of negotiations. And we're optimistic about the prospect for this negotiation and our ability to set the goals that we've achieved. Let me start then by reviewing the economic goals that we have for the United States and um, that the TPP members share. And um, I'm going to talk very much from the perspective of a trade negotiator, which I think is slightly different from some of what we just heard and some of the broader perspectives that they have. Um, I think we, we certainly do recognize the broad goals that we're seeking to achieve here. But for those of us, Mark and I, and others in the room working on this negotiation who have been um, charged with actually getting the deal done, we have a little bit of a different perspective on some of these issues. Let me just go through three goals that we have for the agreement. First, we're seeking to expand trade across the region. Secondly, we're seeking to negotiate a 21st century trade agreement. And third, we're seeking to develop a pathway for the FTAAP. Let me take each of them in turn. First, the goal of expanding trade through this agreement, which is, of course, a key objective of any free trade agreement. But in the wake of the global financial crisis, this goal became all the more urgent. The economies of the Asia-Pacific region already are closely linked through existing trade relationships where companies are taking advantage of the synergies between them. But the economic potential in the Asia Pacific is significant. Through the TPP and by focusing on trade liberalization and facilitation, we can further expand the opportunities and su support and maintain the economic recovery, sustained economic growth, development, and most importantly for all of us, jobs. In the first instance, this means concluding a high standard agreement that liberalizes trade and expands market access between countries in the TPP. And by high standard, I'm going to steal a phrase that Ambassador Mike Moore from New Zealand mentioned to me last week. Um, he said, what we're seeking to do is negotiate an agreement that's the highest common denominator rather than the lowest common denominator. And um, I think for those of us who have worked on a lot of trade negotiations, we of often are put in the position, particularly in multilateral trade negotiations, of negotiating lowest common denominator agreements. But here, I think we're all committed to seeking something more ambitious. Another core objective of the TPP negotiations is building a regional agreement. It's through regionalization that we can facilitate trade and from which many of the benefits of this agreement will ultimately flow. We have considered carefully how best to approach this question from the outset, not as an afterthought. What this means is we are seeking, insofar as possible, to develop one consistent set of TPP rules to cover all trade and trade-related commerce among TPP countries. Market access or the manner in which TPP parties will negotiate tariffs and rules of origin for industrial goods and agriculture and textiles is a critical element in achieving this goal and untangling the so-called spaghetti bowl. We are conscious of the input we have received from businesses about the importance of developing rules that are as simple as possible so that companies are able to take full advantage of the agreement. So the nine countries are, if you will, a coalition of the willing, a phrase from the previous administration, um, that are all committed to such a goal 
and to achieving a common result that promotes a high level of ambition and regional integration. On goods market access, we spent a long time discussing this issue, and we've agreed on a very practical, bottom-up approach that will allow us to achieve this result while recognizing the sensitivities that countries have to navigate. Similarly, we hope to promote and facilitate trade through common and high standard commitments that will apply across the region on, issues, on other issues covered by this agreement. We're seeking ambitious commitments that will create new market access opportunities for companies in services, investment, financial services, telecom, government procurement, and the rest of the chapters that were named before. And we hope to create clear, transparent, and common rules in other areas that will make it faster, easier, and more attractive for businesses, uh, for companies that are doing businesses under what we consider to be a TPP umbrella. So those are the goals generally and what we're seeking to do to promote market access. On the question of a 21st century trade agreement, and I know there's been a lot of discussion and misconceptions about what we mean about a 21st century trade agreement, um, so let me just spend a minute to explain how we got to this and what we're seeking to do here. Um, the discussion on calling this a 21st century trade agreement and thinking about what we're trying to do came from a discussion among the ministers about the fact that many of our trade agreements focus on issues that, that companies used to deal with, border issues that are no longer really the issues that companies face when they're trading. So we wanted to explore a new set of issues that are increasingly the kinds of issues that impede companies being able to do business. And what we came up with is a new set of what we've been calling horizontal issues or cross-cutting issues that have not been fully developed or included in previous agreements that are kind of hard to model if you were trying to do an economic model, but ultimately may be some of the most important work that we're doing in this agreement. Among the cross-cutting issues that we're looking at right now, unless somebody has some good suggestions of other things we should be looking at, are regulatory coherence. And this is, again, another term that has gotten people a little confused and, in some cases, concerned. Um, what we're seeking to do regarding the broad category of regulatory coherence is to develop approaches to eliminate non-tariff barriers and make our regulatory systems as compatible as possible to support our goals of regional integration and efficiency. With tariff barriers falling in many markets, regulatory issues have replaced tariffs as the most challenging barriers companies face in entering foreign markets. So while we're not looking at steps that would limit the right of sovereign governments to regulate, and wouldn't be allowed to even if we wanted to, um, we are looking to find ways to enhance internal regulatory coherence, improve external coordination between regulatory agencies, and uh, cooperation on existing and new regulatory issues. We're also considering whether there are specific sectoral approaches that are appropriate. Of course, any commitments made in the regulatory area are very sensitive for the parties and need to be carefully considered in a step-by-step -step manner. But our goal is to use the TPP to eliminate the unnecessary regulatory barriers companies face and ensure that regulatory barriers do not emerge to impede trade as tariff barriers fall. More generally, we're seeking to make the benefits to companies operating under this TPP umbrella abundant, easy, easier, simpler, and cheaper, and as seamless as possible. Another horizontal issue we're looking at is the issue of competitiveness and co connectivity. Again, an issue that's very hard to define and has been, um, I think, widely misunderstood. And, and one reason why it's been so widely misunderstood is because it's a broad topic that's been looked at by a lot of groups. And there's much work being done in the United States and in many other international institutions on the subject of improving competitiveness. We are discussing the work. We're looking at all of it to see if it's relevant or appropriate to our efforts. But so far, we've focused just on a few areas. Um, the first is lowering costs by improving connectivity and enhancing the efficiency of production and supply chains. We're considering specific steps that would support these goals as well as ensuring that we have a more holistic view of the questions related to supply chain management. We're also looking at areas of commercial law 
and more coordinated efforts in this area that might help particularly the developing TPP countries improve their domestic environments for doing business and making it easier for companies to operate across the region. Another horizontal issue that we've been looking at, which is a, a high priority of this administration, is promoting SMEs, small and medium-sized enterprises. The reason this is a priority for the United States, but also for the other TPP countries, is because SMEs comprise the majority of the businesses in all of our countries and are a key source of job creation. So while some small businesses participate directly or indirectly in trade, we're focusing on specific ways we might be able to promote the participation of small businesses in international trade. In the United States, as many of you know, we're doing significant work um, in the ITC and among the agencies to study the barriers that SMEs have identified to trade. And so we still have more work to do to assess those barriers and those in particular that are unique to small and medium-sized businesses. Certainly many of the barriers they face are very common with what all businesses face. And there are some that can't be addressed directly in trade agreements. But what we'd like to do is look at ways that we really can help promote the participation of small businesses including efforts at transparency, but other specific elements in the agreement. And finally, we're looking at the question of development as an important horizontal issue in TPP. We're seeking to include in TPP, as you all know, countries that are geographically and developmentally quite diverse. So we are looking for ways to ensure that the developing countries that are part of this negotiation can fully participate in a high standard agreement. So far, the discussions on development have focused largely on the issue of capacity building and technical assistance that will help the developing countries both during the negotiations and afterward as they seek to implement the agreement. Um, but we expect further ideas and proposals on this issue as the negotiations progress. As we develop our approaches on these horizontal issues, we're looking at the significant work that's been done in APEC over the last two decades on many of these issues. And this work has been already extremely valuable to our efforts and we'll continue to work closely with our APEC colleagues who are focusing on these issues. For the United States hosting in 2011, we've set an agenda that we hope will mutu be mutually reinforcing with the work that we're doing in TPP. We've also worked very closely with stakeholders here in the United States and abroad on approaches to the 21st century issues to reflect the priorities and values of the countries negotiating the agreement. For the United States, this means looking at possible ways to incorporate new ideas or cooperation on transparency, environmental protection and conservation, workers' rights, promotion of new technologies and emerging economic sectors, such as green technologies, biotech, and the digital economy, and many other sectors. And all of this input's been very valuable to the work that we've done so far, but I urge you all to continue to provide it because we're just three rounds into the negotiation. Let me turn now to the third goal we have, which is a pathway to FTAP, F-T-A-A-P. When we embarked on this negotiation, we and the other TPP countries made clear that while we are beginning with a small group of like-minded countries that share a commitment to negotiating a high standard agreement, our goal for this negotiation is to expand the initial group out to countries across the Asia Pacific. And this remains a core objective for all of us. Last month, we successfully concluded the process to bring Malaysia into the negotiation and, and I think this was most aptly described by the moving from a square table with two countries on each side to a triangular table with three countries on each side. Um, sometimes it's the shape of the table that matters the most. Um, but I think that, um, that Malaysia has now been fully integrated into the negotiation and um, I think really establishing that we are capable of adding another country in, in the midst of the process. Um, as we go forward, we know that there are a lot of other countries that have um, indicated an interest in potentially participating, and we've established a process to engage with them 
um, as, as we continue. Our goal in this process is to ensure that any new members are prepared to fully meet the high standard of the agreement. Um, we also considered the question of a living agreement as part of FTAP and, and broadening this out. And it, by a living agreement, we, we want to establish that not only is this a strong agreement, but it needs to be a platform for a regional agreement. So we want the agreement to be able to evolve, to reflect new issues that emerge, but also to reflect the addition of new members and concerns that emerge by them or by the existing members when we have a new agreement. So we'll be incorporating language related to the question of building a, a living agreement into, the, into these negotiations. I have a very short amount of time, so let me just stop by, uh, end by saying uh, we have established these goals and we've made a lot of progress in three rounds. We also have a lot of challenges ahead of us. Um, I, I will just mention two. The first that we, that we face is the challenge of successfully negotiating an agreement among nine countries. And I know that when people talk about this, it, it, they talk about the fact that we uh, selected these initial countries because it was low-hanging fruit and we could do this really quickly. But I think the trade negotiators who uh, hear those kinds of comments are really kind of aghast at it. And, and when you sit around the table with nine countries, triangular, square, whatever shape the table, I think the daunting nature of a, a negotiation of this standard with nine countries is readily apparent to everybody around the table. Um, so far, we've been coordinating closely. I think we've found very practical solutions to the problems that we've encountered. But it is no doubt a challenge um, to negotiate with nine countries, and certainly more of a challenge the more countries we add. A second challenge is how we deal with the expansion of the group. Um, as I said, several countries are expressing interest. For us, I think we need to be sure that the countries that are considering joining understand the standards we're seeking and are fully prepared to meet them. The issue here is not a question of people realizing the value of additional countries. The question is our ability to negotiate a high standard agreement that we can conclude and pass through our respective legislative processes. Uh, it's always been our position that it makes little sense to launch a negotiation if you don't believe that you can carry it to conclusion, including the legislative process. So ultimately, ho we hope we have the opportunity to build this out to a place that we can add more countries, since that is one of the overriding goals of this agreement. But we do want to do so carefully and with um, attention paid to all the parties joining, understanding what the goals and objectives of the agreement are. And there will be many other challenges as we proceed. I don't want to go through them. They're too numerous to challenge. Um, but I want to close by saying that we intend to continue our intensive outreach efforts and appreciate all the support we've gotten so far. We have one more planned round for this year in New Zealand and five planned already for next year. So we have a lot of work to do to bring this negotiation to a successful conclusion. And um, you know, so far, I think things have gone really well. And I'm optimistic that we can get where we need to go and also very aware of the challenges ahead. So thank you. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, my thanks, first of all, to um, Fred Bergston and Hataka Yamasan and the Japan Economic Foundation for the invitation and this opportunity to uh, address such a very distinguished um, gathering. My brain tells me it's uh, about four o'clock in the morning, so I've uh, produced some slides to help guide me through um, all of this. Our brief um, for this session was uh, substance and membership. Um, I've tried to frame my remarks using uh, several headings, uh, the when, why, what, how and who of um, TPP. Um, when, I wanted to kick off with a quick word on some of the origins of TPP from a, a New Zealand perspective because it goes back a bit further for us than for some of the others around the table. The why is about the goals, uh, what we set out to achieve in this initiative. The what, I'll, I'll try and touch on the issues that we are working on in the negotiation. The how, uh, how we are going about it, particularly given that this is an exercise uh, in regional integration. 
And finally, who? Uh, this is the membership question. Not just a question of who's involved, but um, how we arrived at the group, and more particularly, as, as we've just um, uh, heard from, from Barbara, uh, some questions around how membership might uh, evolve in the future. So let's, let's start with the, um, the when. Um, my watch has died on me. Can I ask? I've got a clock here. That's okay. I'll uh, keep an eye on, on, uh, on time. Um, TPP is above all a regional initiative from, from our perspective, not just another FTA. Um, those whose memories go back a long way will recall that um, Bob Hawke, then Australian Prime Minister Bob Hawke, launched APEC in Canberra in 1989. Uh, President Clinton hosted um, the first APEC leaders meeting at Blake Island in 1993 and a year later APEC leaders uh, adopted the Bogor Goals calling for free and open trade and investment in the APEC region. So that was a, an early vision. Um, the vision is one thing, uh, the question always is, is how to deliver uh, on it. Some of the smaller players in the region, and I'm thinking here of Chile, New Zealand and Singapore, were early movers in trying to move from, from the talk, from the vision, uh, to action on regional integration. Um, in our own case, this meant a bilateral FTA with Singapore in 2000, followed by the launch of a P3 negotiation, as we called it, uh, between New Zealand, Singapore and Chile, which we concluded in 2005 as the Trans-Pacific Strategic Economic Partnership. Um, the, the P4 as it became with the uh, addition of um, Brunei. Uh, we took a step further. Um, it rested at that point until behind the scenes discussions with the United States got underway uh, in 2007. Um, the United States initially uh, decided to join a negotiation on the investment and financial services chapters that had been missing uh, from the original P4. Um, that got underway early in 2008. Uh, not surprisingly, um, United States interest uh, generated wider interest around the region uh, to the point that by the end of 2008, after the APEC leaders meeting in uh, Peru, we had eight countries ready to launch a negotiation for an expanded uh, Trans-Pacific Partnership. And the final go-ahead for the current negotiation came in uh, 2008. Um, in the form of statements from uh, President Obama uh, from Suntory Hall and um, Ambassador Kirk in, uh, in, in, in Singapore. Um, in making his announcement, President Obama talked of the benefits from continued integration of the economies of the region and set out a goal of shaping a regional agreement with broad-based membership and the high standards worthy of a 21st century trade agreement. Th those themes I think you'll continue to hear whenever um, participants in the um, negotiation talk about what sort of vision uh, they are working to. So much for the, uh, the history and the vision. Um, let's turn to the substance of what we actually mean by a high standards regional integration initiative. If I go back to the vision, um, there's probably no better place to start than the preamble and objectives of the original P4. Uh, the agreement creates a strategic partnership. I mean, even from the start, we as a group of economies were declaring that this was something larger than a regular FTA. It was a long-range project that we were embarking on. We saw it very much as a regional, part, as a regional initiative, one that grew out of APEC and that explicitly referenced some of the APEC work, such as the principles to enhance competition. It was explicitly about making markets work by protecting and promoting the competitive process. We believe in, in markets in this group. The partners highlighted their wish to enhance the competitiveness of their firms, and it goes back to some of the points Barbara um, was making uh, just now about uh, trying to unpick the elements of that um, in a trade negotiation context. Uh, the original P4 partners set out to promote integration. Uh, the agreement commits us to promote common frameworks in the Asia-Pacific region. And finally, and not least, the original P4 committed themselves to encourage other APEC economies to join the project. So you'll see from those elements 
there's a bit more to it than the, um, uh, the elements that normally drive um, a conventional uh, free trade agreement negotiation. Let's move on to the, to the what. What does the TPP initiative look like in practice as we move uh, into 2011? The heart of it, obviously, is a conventional free trade negotiation. Uh, we've been negotiating as a group of eight and now nine countries across all the core FTA chapters, um, goods, services, investment, trade remedies, TBT, SPS, and so on. We're also working on a number of issues which don't appear in all FTAs, but which are definitely on the agenda in the current TPP process. And I include in that um, issues such as environment, labour, telecoms, financial services, uh, business mobility. More interesting, perhaps, is, is, is the question of how we are going about it. We are wrestling, in particular, with the question of what we need to do to really make TPP work as a platform for regional integration. Um, market opening is obviously a, a starting point. Uh, creating an extended TPP marketplace through tariff elimination, uh, trade-friendly rules of origin, market access commitments in investment services, government procurement and so on. So there is an important uh, liberalisation agenda which is central to TPP. But traditional market opening doesn't deal with what happens behind the border. Um, as tariffs continue to come down, as business moves towards specialisation with uh, many companies uh, focusing on niche roles in regional or global supply chains, uh, the focus turns more and more to regulatory barriers. Uh, you've heard people talk about the spaghetti bowl problem. I, I think Barbara touched on it just, just now. Um, the issue here is the tangle of regulatory barriers that are the curse of traders that are trying to operate on a seamless basis in multiple markets. The challenge for us as negotiators is to uh, deliver on the integration goal and do something that really makes a difference uh, for those small traders in particular who are trying to operate in multiple markets. We're approaching it from several angles. Um, all of us are certainly focusing on delivering more jobs and better jobs through this initiative. Uh, it's plain enough that small and medium enterprises are the strongest contributors to job creation. So making the TPP marketplace more friendly to smaller businesses, uh, making it easier for them to operate beyond their own borders is an obvious goal for us. Um, cutting red tape and regulatory overheads really matters. Um, for the same reasons, we are asking ourselves whether the rules that we are negotiating work for companies that form part of regulatory supply chains. And again, this is not just about the Fortune 500 operators. Uh, this is also about the, the little guys who are providing those specialised inputs uh, and niche products. Let's move on. I've talked about substance. Let's move on to membership, the question of who's, um, who's involved. Uh, plainly, the current TPP group has a lot more weight to it than the, um, than the original uh, P4 deal. Um, having the United States and the TPP alone transforms the, um, uh, the size of the group. Uh, but the question I think many are wondering, uh, not least in today's uh, forum, uh, is this. Is it now a case of more is better uh, for TPP? This doesn't lend itself to a, um, a one-word uh, one answer. Um, and I, again, give you a, a negotiator's um, perspective as, as Barbara did uh, earlier, earlier. Any FTA is a, a complex exercise. Um, a negotiation involving nine countries, uh, particularly when you're talking about a group as diverse as the current TPP, is more complex again. Uh, and yet more complex when you are talking about a um, when you're working towards a comprehensive and high quality deal with an agenda that goes well beyond liberalisation, as I said before, uh, into the economic integration space. So we have set ourselves a huge, huge task. One thing that I think um, should help us and is helping us from experience to date uh, is that we're not starting from zero. Uh, none of us in the, the current group are strangers to this game. We've all done high quality FTAs. Um, four countries in the group already have uh, FTAs with the United States. 
And I would add that the, the template that um, the original P4 uh, negotiated uh, drew heavily on models that have been used previously in um, uh, FTAs with the United States, um, the use of a negative list uh, for services, uh, for, for example. On top of that, um, I think it is very relevant that Australia and New Zealand have negotiated um, with Brunei, Malaysia, Singapore and Vietnam to produce what we call the ANSFTA uh, agreement, which sets some um, benchmarks in terms of market access, um, quality, tariffs, um, rules of origin uh, that would uh, probably be unrecognisable to um, our colleagues um, uh, negotiating in, in Geneva in terms of what is achievable within a group of that uh, mix of um, stages of uh, uh, development. So I feel we have demonstrated that it's feasible to negotiate good quality rules and market access commitments across a comprehensive agenda among countries at very different stages of development. Let's look ahead. Um, some have commented today on what the optimal configuration of a TPP should be. Um, any analysis is likely to suggest that the big gains come um, ultimately when TPP grows to become an APEC-wide agreement. And that indeed is our goal, a free trade area of the Asia-Pacific or, or an FTAP. So the question becomes, why don't we go straight to that objective? I have to say that uh, our view um, is that this comes back uh, very much to practicalities. We've all seen how hard it is to get progress across a less ambitious agenda in the Doha process. Uh, it is not easy to see how we could deliver a comprehensive FTAAP deal in a realistic time frame if we tried to launch a negotiation uh, from scratch with the whole APEC membership. So for now, there are strong reasons to work within a group uh, that is of manageable size um, and made up of countries that already have ex uh, experience of negotiating quality deals without uh, Geneva-style compromises. But a deal within the current group will only be one step uh, along the way. Uh, TPP is, and I have to emphasise this, an inclusive initiative. Uh, for the reasons I set out at the start, it is premised entirely on progressive expansion to include um, the wider APEC membership. I think this has to happen um, reasonably promptly. Um, we've seen elsewhere what happens when negotiations bog down and lose momentum. And it's my observation that within the current TPP group, there is a real sense that we need to move ahead as um, far and as fast as we can, particularly over the next few rounds, so that um, at some point uh, next year we are able to um, arrive at a, a good sense um, of whether we have the, um, the makings of a, uh, a deal that we can close. Uh, can we get there? Um, my parting shot is that uh, progress to date certainly encourages me to think we have a realistic chance to um, achieve that. Uh, we should not underestimate the scale of the challenge, but um, within the group um, there is no lack of uh, commitment. Uh, goodwill and, as Barbara noted, um, a very practical approach uh, to the issues. Thank you. The uh, floor is open for questions. Please identify your name, please. Uh, Gary Elfbauer with the Peterson Institute. Thanks very much for your remarks. Uh, I noticed that uh, both Barbara and Mark carefully dodged the question of whether Japan and Canada will be invited in the initial phases, and I know your answer will be it's above my pay grade. So I'm not going to ask you that question. Instead, I'll ask you a question which I hope is at your pay grade. You have this long list, which rather reminds us of the Doha round, plus some extra items. But the one item which is not on the list is current account balances, in the sense that Geithner mentioned it. And that's clearly an issue with Japan, but it's also clearly an issue with other potential countries. So do you think you can widen the discussion 
in the TPP to include some kind of commitment to maintain uh, a range of current account balances or limit the imbalances? What's that directed at me? I might leave that to my colleagues <laughs> in the G20. <laughs> Very convenient. Um, I, I think it's, it's inappropriate to answer that question um, in the aftermath of the discussions of this past weekend and until we see how those discussions develop. Um, certainly, people are aware of the relationship and there are discussions about how the trade negotiations should be related to these broader discussions, but in light of the fact that those discussions have just concluded and, and we have to wait to see how they progress, I think I'm going to leave that one aside for the moment. Okay, uh, this gentleman, yes. Uh, Ernie Prieg, a Manufacturers Alliance. Uh, my question is about uh, within the group of nine, it seems eight are fairly well advanced with free trade agreements, open markets, but then there's Vietnam. And uh, I, I wish you some comment because when it comes to labor standards, they, they hardly exist in Vietnam. When it comes to regulatory policies, NTBs, uh, much more complicated, and American businessmen there. Uh, very concerned about the corruption dimension of these kind of regulatory investment, uh, non-transparent <laughs> rules. And then you have the dominant position of China in Vietnam. I think uh, Vietnamese imports of manufacturers are five or ten times larger from China than the U.S. And trade balance the other direction here, it's all imports from Vietnam to some extent from Chinese companies there. So how has Vietnam fitted in thus far uh, as quite a very different trading situation with the other eight? Uh, let, let me um, kick off on, on that one. Um, as I mentioned in my remarks, um, we, um, Australia and New Zealand, um, have recently concluded a free trade agreement with the countries of ASEAN that includes... Is your, is your mic on, by the way? I can... Yeah. Sure it is on. Oh. Ah, okay. Um, my, much better. That, that might help. Um, we uh, concluded a couple of years ago a free trade agreement that involved Australia, New Zealand and the countries of, of ASEAN and Vietnam was a very active participant. Um, they are extremely tough negotiators as any of you who were involved with their WTO accession process um, will know. But what I think is relevant about the outcome um, of that in relation to your question uh, is that at least in respect of um, the, the market access commitments and disciplines, we felt we achieved a very high quality result. Um, speaking from a New Zealand perspective, we ended up with uh, tariff commitments that um, take us to tariff elimination on 99% of our exports to Vietnam by 2020, coupled with um, high quality um, modern rules of origin. Um, in areas such as services, we've got um, good rules but much more limited um, market access uh, commitments. Now that wasn't a negotiation uh, quite as wide in its scope as what we are embarking on in TPP but if the basic question is you know, can Vietnam participate and negotiate effectively in that sort of setting, uh, we have no doubt at all from our experience with the ASEAN negotiation and from what we've seen to date that yes they can um, uh, engage and they certainly know how to look after themselves in that sort of a setting. Thank you. Uh, this lady. And after that, uh, uh, yeah. Thank you. Sally James from the Cato Institute here in Washington, D.C. I'm just curious about the status of the FTAs that have, there's, a, there's quite a few FTAs that already exist within the, the nine members. What's the status of the, uh, of the commitments in those? Are they open again? Or does the United States or any other countries with established FTAs consider that those market access agreements are done deals and, and that any FTAs within the group would have to build on those schedules as they exist now? Thank you. We made a decision together in the first round that the existing FTAs would coexist with the new TPP agreement. So um, the new TPP agreement will in some cases be a higher standard or include new provisions that aren't in the existing agreements, but the existing agreements will continue to live on 
and only in the case where there's some kind of conflict between the two agreements do we need to determine what we're going to do between the agreements. So I think that um, in the case of, let's say, market access commitments, those commitments will continue to live on if there's a decision by the parties to revisit those issues and revisit market access schedules and goods or services um, at some point in the negotiation, then that decision will be made. I mean, to date, the United States has said that we are going to retain the existing market access schedules that we have in our pre-existing FTAs. Um, other countries may choose to do that or not to do that. But I think that um, the fact that the, exist the agreements are going to coexist allows us the flexibility to choose to do that in the way that's most appropriate for each government. Yes. Hello, uh, Jamie Strawbridge from Inside U.S. Trade. Uh, just had two uh, clarification questions. One had to do with a topic um, that Mr. Toyota brought up in his remarks. Um, he was saying there's a minority view within the U.S. government that bilateral issues such as BSE uh, would have to be resolved before um, a country like Japan could be brought into the talks. Ms. Moisel, could you address that point at all? Um, is there is there any um, is that a feeling that USTR uh, believes that issues like that Japan would have to provide assurances on? Um, and then the second question, uh, either for Mr. Sinclair uh, or Ms. Weisel, uh, just trying to understand, I understand the importance of uh, concluding a 21st century, kind of a new generation agreement for TPP. Um, it also seems like in the negotiations, the starting point it, for a lot of these areas is the P4 text. I, is that just a starting point and then we're moving to something beyond or how does that work uh, kind of in a nuts and bolts way? Thank you. On your first question, um, I think um, this was discussed in the previous panel and I don't really have a lot to add to what was said there. There have been internal discussions at high levels and across the government with all the agencies that are involved and um, we are in quiet discussions with those countries that have expressed interest, including Japan. And, and um, when those discussions get to a point where, where there's some kind of conclusion, then we'll have something to say. But at this point, I think it's most appropriate to just allow those discussions to take place quietly. Um, on, uh, on Jamie's second question, um, uh, sure, I think those of us who are part of the original um, P4 are uh, naturally um, uh, and are focused on, on um, the model that was set out um, there and its continuing relevance to what we're trying to achieve now. But I think the best way to um, actually address your specific question is to hark back to a remark made by um, a previous uh, Chilean lead negotiator who um, during the very intensive uh, preparatory process that we went through before launching the, um, uh, the uh, expanded TPP, um, uh, argued that what, what we were trying to achieve was um, something analogous to a, a house renovation. You could make all sorts of changes to the, the windows and the doors um, uh, and the bathrooms, um, but at the end of the day it had to be recognisable as the original house. That was the, uh, the vision that, that Chile uh, took into it and we thought that was um, a pretty good way to uh, approach it. I mean, the reality is um, that with the um, expansion that has taken place in, in the size of the group, um, this is not uh, and never could be just a case of uh, turning up and signing on the uh, dotted line. It has merely elements of a, um, a new negotiation to it. Yes. Claude Barfield, AEI. Uh, Gary said that uh, we shouldn't ask you about uh, Canada and Japan because this is above your pay grade. I'd just like to make a comment about Canada, not so much Japan. With all due respect to my Japanese friends, I think it's going to be tough for the Japanese government to make up its mind on this and many other issues. But with Canada, it is really striking. And I'll have to say that the view from outside to a great degree, is this is governed by fairly narrow parochial <coughs> reasons in the United States and, and New Zealand. And the idea that Canada would be fobbed off to the future when you're pushing Malaysia, for God's sake, or talking about Vietnam, uh, it seems to me is ludicrous, 
both from an economic point of view, but from the United States point of view, Canada is a strategic partner. Now, I know Wendy Dobson is here. Maybe she should be, be saying this. But it also raises, it seems to me, a larger question um, at, as to where you'll be in 2000, the end of 2011, 2012, and then how that relates to countries that are not yet in the TPP. I mean, how far along will you get in negotiations with decisions si d decided on key issues before you expand, and then you get the situation where whether it's Japan or other countries in Asia, they are presented with the fait accompli. In other words, the major decisions have been made, and they must come in to pursuant to those decisions. And will that be a problem later? I mean, it's a good question, and it's one that we've pondered over for a long time. Uh, I think that when the United States joined TPP, we spent more than a year discussing with the original P4 members what our goals and objectives would be and how um, our, our congressional uh, colleagues would view this negotiation and came to an understanding of how we were going to proceed. As we're looking at expanding the group, there's clearly the question of adding members who add economic heft and the tension between that and the difficulty of not only completing the negotiation, but bringing it to the conclusion through our respective legislative processes. I think, as I said in my remarks, I think it's, it's very important for us to be very clear about what the standards of the agreement. We are, after all, here negotiating a trade deal. And uh, that trade deal has been established to have very high standards. The parties that are at the table have agreed to those high standards. Um, we are not pre-negotiating the deal. We are not, um, we don't have an entrance fee, as was uh, put earlier. But we are expecting countries to establish that they are prepared to meet those standards so that we don't have to lower the standard to a lowest common denominator kind of a situation. Um, when Malaysia joined the negotiation, they spent a long time internally discussing those issues that had been very difficult for them through our bilateral FTA process and whether or not they were going to be in the position to include those issues in the negotiation in a way that would be acceptable in a high standard agreement. We did not pre-negotiate the agreement. There wasn't an entrance fee per se in that they had to sign on the dotted line exactly what it was that they were going to be negotiated, negotiating, but there had to be an understanding that if you're coming into a negotiation of this type where we're trying to do a groundbreaking high standard agreement, then you are going to be prepared to open your market across the board on goods, agriculture services, in, in a way that all of the players around the table expect. And I think that that has been made clear to any country that has established an interest in joining and in the conversations that we've had. Um, I, don't, I, I think it would not be in our interest to allow countries to join that are going to lower the standard of the agreement. Um, not only do I think we wouldn't conclude the agreement based on the politics in the United States and other countries, but I think that's not the goal that we've set for ourselves in the agreement. Which brings us to your second question of uh, what happens when you're not in the first mover group and you are sort of presented with a fait accompli. We understand that that may be an uncomfortable situation for some countries, and to the, to the extent that those countries are prepared to move quickly, then we will respond as quickly as we can um, in this first tranche. Um, if they are not prepared to move that quickly and the process does not allow us to bring them in that quickly, then we will try to work with them to make it as comfortable as possible to bring them in when some key decisions have been made. I think that the key decisions that are being made among the group are decisions that would be likely to play out that way, no matter who's in the group. And as I said, we have this element of a living agreement to accommodate um, changes that might be, might be sought or might, we might need to make if new countries came to the table. But I think it's, it goes back to the original question of how do you negotiate a regional agreement with 21 countries around the table and make it high standard and worthwhile versus a smaller group where you can negotiate a higher standard but then therefore have to find a different approach in tranches as we've come up with here to get where you're trying to go ultimately. Uh, Mr. Bogustin as well as uh, Mr. Schott. Uh, let me ask a follow-up 
question to that, to the two negotiators. In practice, what you're in is kind of a rolling negotiation where you've got Malaysia has just been brought in, Canada's knocking at the door, we're speculating about Japan, and I suspect there are other countries, some have mentioned the Philippines, some have mentioned Indonesia, who at some point, maybe not too far down the road, will want to come in. Korea, we know, after the chorus FDA. When do you cut it off and go for implementation? How do you decide when to call a halt in the evolution which you want toward a comprehensive FDAAP and say, we've got a TPP with a group that we now want to implement, take to our legislatures, see how it gets implemented. I mean, how do you decide when you're at that inflection point where it's time to stop adding and going for implementation? Related to that, and this is the congressional question here, but I suspect it's other parliaments too, when you go to the Congress with an agreement with, let's say right now, nine countries, if that's what it turned out to be, and you drew the line now, do you run into the Barfield problem? It's locked in because Congress has voted and everybody else then has to sign up to the same terms. Or conversely, does Congress say, well, but we know Korea's waiting and we know um, uh, Japan's gonna come in in a couple of years, so we'll just wait till then because until then we don't know what the whole thing is gonna look like. How do you deal with that inherently rolling nature of the negotiation in a context where you yourselves, rightly, in my view, have said the ultimate objective is a comprehensive FTAAP? Let, let, let me kick off on that. Um, I mean, the, the, the answer to your first question from a, a negotiator's um, perspective is, um, is, is pretty, pretty simple. Um, uh, even with the current nine, we have uh, a task ahead of us that is um, enormously challenging. Um, and as we move, as we are now moving, um, beyond discussion on concepts and elements and into uh, text and then um, quite, quite soon into uh, the negotiation of specific commitments um, in the various market access areas. Um, the, the, the window for bringing other countries uh, in uh, becomes much, much tighter. So from a practical perspective, I think we are you know, close to the point at which we have to say, well, yes, sure, more would be much more interesting, but um, we really cannot afford to lose momentum and to add the amount of time that is involved if you um, uh, bring in you know, uh, a large number of other large players uh, with all that that implies for um, you know, progress within the, uh, in the negotiation. Now that's a, a strictly a, a negotiator's uh, perspective, but um, if we do set, you know, set ourselves the goal of, of getting uh, an initial result within a reasonable time, those factors start to become uh, pretty compelling. If I could just add to that. Um, I mean, basically the question you're asking goes at some of the issues that we analyzed at the beginning of this administration and in the previous administration when we were looking at how we wanted to approach our trade policy in the Asia Pacific. And that is the question of how do you move forward an aggressive trade agenda that allows us to engage in the Asia Pacific in a meaningful way. We tried bilateral approaches and we found that passing bilateral trade agreements through our Congress one by one when they were relatively small trade agreements was very, very difficult. Um, Doha is not moving all that quickly and so there's a frustration there. So the approach that we took was to try to find something regional that allowed the agreement to have a significant enough weight to be consequential and therefore be of interest to members of Congress beyond the narrow trade issues, but still allow us to go forward and conclude a negotiation. And so we came up with this approach, which we are still working through many of the elements. The questions that you raise are real ones and real concerns for the countries that are potentially seeking to join. I think that I would have a slight nuance on Mark's answer, and that is to say that um, I think we don't really have the answer to that question at this point. We do reach an inflection point as negotiators, 
but I think that um, we're kind of making up these rules as we go along. Um, and when we get to a point in the process that we think it's useful to add another country, we're going to have to figure out whether or not we want to conclude the first tranche and add them at that point, or whether or not it makes sense to take a more open approach. And I, I think we can't know that now because we don't have any countries that have expressed interest, that have made a decision internally that they want to join, that we know are capable of meeting those standards. If we were to reach that point through a process of quiet consultation and there was a confidence, then we would have to determine how we're going to proceed. But I think that, you know, as a negotiating matter, it would be very difficult. But in terms of the broader goals of this initiative and, and where we want to take things, I just I think we have to decide the answer to that question when the time comes, and we just can't know it right now. Uh, Mr. Toyoda, do you have something to say at uh, this stage? Yes. Uh, thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, in listening to what the uh, Barbara and, and Mark um, have said, um, it seems to me there are two important things um, uh, for the negotiations. One is that uh, um, you could uh, um, um, keep uh, the door open to any, any countries uh, which have interest in, in uh, participating in the negotiation. But the second thing is, is quite important for uh, both of you that uh, the country should uh, um, um, uh, 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 be ready uh, to meet the higher standard. I, I think perhaps that's uh, quite quite important. And, and I think uh, <coughs> as far as, as Japan is, is concerned, what uh, um, um, uh, uh, ministers uh, discussing is that uh, um, first uh, they are um, 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 uh, ready to put everything on the table. And, and, and then uh, whether or not uh, they are um, ready to meet the higher standards. So um, two legitimate questions uh, you have uh, raised. But my, 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 my point here is, is that if um, Japanese ministers, and particularly the final decision is made by uh, prime minister, if they are ready to put everything on the table um, and ready to meet the highest standard, I hope uh, you could welcome that um, position. Um, that's uh, um, my um, uh, point, which um, I would like to emphasize in uh, listening to uh, the position of both of you um, in two important countries. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I appreciate those panelists who uh, have uh, answered those nasty questions uh, very efficiently, and uh, uh, time is up. Uh, though there are, uh, there might be other questions, uh, please refrain from raising those questions. Thank you very much.